Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Game to Com video, we're going to be, as usual, discussing tech news which has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Primarily, this video is going to be focused upon Vega, um, Threadripper, and Intel's upcoming Coffee Lake range of processors. So starting things out, we're going to be discussing the Budapest RX Vega event, where AMD's official blog has given us some indications on the GPU's pricing and performance. Then we're going to move over to the Vega leaks, which I didn't cover yesterday. This is primarily aesthetics of the card, what it looks like, the um, connectors, power connectors, that type of thing. Then we're going to finish with the AMD stuff with the Threadripper lineup. That's right, the entire set of SKUs appears to have leaked on to the internet. And finally, much the same thing actually happened to Intel, because it's a Coffee Lake S series of processor specifications have also leaked out to the internet. So we're going to start out with Budapest first, and I'd like to thank two viewers for sending over this particular link. That is, once again, to the AMD official blog. That is Henrik and George. So thanks very much to those individuals. So I feel most of you <clears throat> at this point know what AMD have been doing, showing RX Vega to various games and essentially doing a side-by-side -side comparison. So we have confirmation here of the setup, uh, both monitors, which one was a FreeSync, one was a G-Sync. The FreeSync monitor was an Asus MX34Q, while the G-Sync was a PG34. Now there are a couple of differences, one was a VA, one was an IPS, and of course one's FreeSync, one's G-Sync, one had slightly better viewing angles, one had slightly better contrast slash color reproduction. But essentially both monitors were limited to 100 hertz, both systems had Ryzen 7 1800X processors and 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, no mention on clock speed with that. However, apparently the reason to avoid opinions was they didn't allow frame rates to be shown. They wanted people to just basically decide upon the merits of the display themselves. In fact, AMD specifically mentioned, quote, the point of this challenge was, could a trained gamer's eyes tell the difference? Did one seem faster or smoother? Most gamers said that the left system was smoother. Others mentioned the right system was more colourful. Some gamers are not slash r slash AMD, in other words, Reddit, based on available information, argued that the left system had to be G-Sync because the monitor of it was an IPS characteristics. Though the Radeon RX Vega plus FreeSync, which was the left system, came out on top on most gamers, they said the differences were minimal and they couldn't tell the difference. Now... All of that stuff is pretty much reinforcing information what we know. So what differences are there? Well, there's a couple of things. One, in this particular post, um, the biggest difference between the two systems was the price simply on the monitor itself. The G-Sync display costing 300 US dollars more than its FreeSync counterpart. And then I'm going to read this verbatim. So here's the question every gamer will have to ask themselves. Is the NVIDIA G-Sync solution worth it for a few extra... 100 extra bucks if it provides almost the same or in Buddha case, Budapest, excuse me, case, somewhat inferior experience. Even if we pitted, now this is the crucial bit, so listen to this very carefully and check out on screen. Even if we pitted the Radeon RX Vega against the mightier GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, my money would be that the similar outcomes, that you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference with variable refresh rates, and I believe no gamer should ever consider buying a monitor, I just want to stress that word one more time, a monitor that isn't capable of a variable refresh rate. And then the individual who's written this particular post decides to go on and say that he really enjoyed his time at the event, and so on and so on. Now, I'm just going to repeat that one more time. Even if we pitted the Radeon RX Vega against the mightier GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. So what this tells me is that this card is not most likely going to beat a GTX 1080 Ti. The prices for this card are invariably going to be very equal to a GTX 1080. So also the other takeaway from this is that AMD really wants to quash any ideas that we were trying to get performance data or they were trying to show that the performance between the two systems was identical. No, they're really trying to... Uh, I'm almost putting words into their mouth. So, you know, I'm not saying this is 100% accurate, but to me, it looks like they're saying, okay, for the same experience, essentially, you can pay us money. 
Now, I grant you that this is not the best way of describing this always, because yes, okay, if you're playing Battlefield or Doom or a game that can push these type of frame rates, yeah, that definitely takes things into consideration. Like, But if you're running at like a 4K screen, then obviously the graphics card's more important. The other thing, let's say you already have a monitor and it's a really nice screen. Let's say, for example, you've bought into the G-Sync monitor. Let's say you bought one for the, I don't know, the GTX 980. Or maybe even the 980 Ti or whatever. Then what? Do you then take into consideration, well, I've already bought into the NVIDIA architecture. Uh, NVIDIA ecosystem. So it, it's just kind of like, I don't necessarily agree with pricing in this scenario 100%. But I can appreciate where they're coming from. Here's the other piece of Vega news, and that is images of the cards themselves. I admit I just didn't include this yesterday, but a number of you, a lot of you, messaged me and emailed me asking if I was going to cover this, so I figured I'd throw it into this video. Yesterday's already got pretty lengthy, so I decided just to kind of forego this. But anyway, so we have a couple of different versions of the 64, and we also have a version that is going to be, they're saying, limited edition. So the reference edition looks very reminiscent of the 400 or 500 um, Polaris series. And, you know, it, it doesn't look bad or anything like that. It's pretty much what you'd expect. It will have a dual 8-pin power connector, and it is, of course, a double slot. Display outputs are one HDMI and triple display port. Then you've got a limited edition. This essentially looks kind of similar, but looks a bit more pretty, I guess is the best way of describing it. Other than the colour scheme, you'll also notice the R in the top, which apparently lights up. And it will be slightly more costly. Finally, there's the actual liquid edition. But there are no actual images of that. So all I can tell you is that it's going to feature liquid cooling. But once again, there are no images. But I thought I'd just mention it because otherwise people are going to ask, where is it? Okay, I'd now like to thank John... Uh, I think it was perhaps one of the more interesting pieces of news that actually popped up because we have info on Threadripper, uh, including the entire set of SKUs. Now, the reason I think this is interesting isn't because, you know, hey, we've got specifications. It's because we actually see 8-core, 16-thread, uh, Threadripper processor. So, this actually popped up on a website by the name of of Planet 3D Now. However, it's originally part of AMD's own official product master PDF. Now, what we have here is some ambiguity regarding base clocks, turbo clocks, that type of thing. But what we do have is an awful, an awfully good understanding now of the product lineup. So, once again, the Threadripper 1900 and 1900X are 8 core 16 threads, so we can presume there's going to be the usual clock speed differences that, for example, the 1700X and the 1700 have shown previously. We've got the, 70, the 1950 and 1950X, basically the same scenario, and then you've got the 1920 and the 1920X. So the primary difference here, of course, that most folks are going to notice is the core count. Now, there are definitely advantages of, let's say, the 8-core 16-thread Threadripper over, let's say, the 1800X. And that is you get those additional PCIe lanes. You get quad-channel memory, that type of thing. The problem is it's very hard for me to argue that that's a good buy for most people. If the motherboards were cheap, sure, that's a good entry. That's a good way to say, okay, I'm going to do this now, and then six months later, perhaps... You know, maybe you're learning the basics. I'm just using an example of like Unreal Engine and say 3ds Max. So at the moment, you're doing very little other than making basic boxes and small levels and perhaps doing a little bit of video editing. So you don't really need that additional power, but maybe in the future you do. So maybe you do an upgrade and this is a cheap way to do that. The problem is the boards are already so bloody expensive. It's not like you're going to save like a whole bunch of cash. And quite honestly, um, yes, the I.O. is definitely a good thing, but I, I, 
I don't think people. Um, obviously, your scenario might diff, might be very different, and obviously, it does depend upon I/O. It does depend on your need for multiple graphics cards and that type of thing. But I think the average person, the average high-end individual who perhaps has a couple of graphics cards, probably doesn't need 64 PCIe lanes. And I would probably say if they only need an eight-core 16-thread processor, I say only, and of course, the loosest ten, sense, it's still very, uh, uh, still bloody good number of cores but if that's all you need then probably a regular uh am4 setup would do you but still it's nice that this is there i'm very curious to see what the pricing is going to be oh and a couple of people also messaged me regarding the bauer now he of course got hold of a threadripper processor took it apart delidded it in other words and showed that there were four uh cores inside of it now AMD have actually asked him to take down the video. It's not deleted, it's just taken down. He said it will be back up in the not too distant future. And to be honest, he's pretty confused himself. He's like, I don't know why they asked me to do this. Apparently they gave him permission to put the video up. And then they've asked him a couple of days later to take it down. I really don't understand the point. If it was like one of those things where like, no one ever was able to, you know, download images or share this stuff but it had already gone viral at that point everyone including ourselves but everyone had covered this everyone in the tech industry you know every major website had already kind of picked up on this and at that point it's like the cat's out of the bag so i don't really understand what there was to gain from trying to take down the video but hey it is what it is and so i just thought i'd let you guys know speaking of things i'd let you know let's talk about the coffee lake series so what happens when Intel is behind AMD? Are they going to say, A, eh, that's fine, you guys have some time in the sun, you deserve it. Or B, are they going to try and slap them back down again? I think we all know the answer to that. Of course they're going to let them have their time in the sun. No. On a serious note, Coffee Lake is coming. And most folks know that, of course, it does represent the first entry for Intel, at least, into the six-core mainstream market. Now, this is a pretty exciting time for PC users because I must admit that 8700K does sound rather enticing on paper. Obviously, we'll have to wait until we see the performance in real life. But anyway, we have finally some confirmed specifications for this card. Now, this information actually originates on the Anantech forum. So I'd like to thank Jamie for sending this over. So, what do we have? Well, I won't read out all the specifications because you can pretty much read them yourself. But, what we have here is, at least for the 8700K, a 4.7 GHz single core max frequency, in other words, turbo. If it goes to hexa-core, then that's 4.3 GHz, which is still pretty damn good. The 8700, in other words, the non-K, is basically the same, only the single core turbo isn't quite as high, neither is the dual, neither is the quad but the hexa-core speeds are identical. Integrated memory controller, the base frequency is 2666, not too surprising there. DDR4 overclock is capable only on the K. Smart, ca smart cache, excuse me, size is 12 megabytes. Uh, we also have the 8600K, and this is confirmation right here of the number of processor cores, six which is pretty cool. So even the the i5s are going to be nudged up to six cores, assuming these leaks are accurate, and I wouldn't be surprised if they are. The clock speeds are somewhat more lean, I suppose is the best way of describing this, with the max turbo frequency of a single core only 4.3 gigahertz, but still, that's not, that's not shabby. You know, you're not going to be complaining too much. And of course, all of the normal bits and pieces that you'd expect, like, for example, it's LGA 1151, um, the TJ Maxx is, well, you know, 95 watts TDP, that type of thing. Um, and obviously there's going to be a couple of different derivatives of this. We've also got the 8400 as well. Uh, it also has 80, I'm sorry, 84 processor cores. What was I going to say? Uh, six processor cores. The major difference here is the processor clocks are much lower. Uh, only 4 gigahertz for the single core for, uh, max speeds and hexa core is only 3.8 so that's pretty damn low and obviously overclocking is not as supported and only has a thermal design power of uh, 65 watts so it's kind of like the you know the low end 
one that no one really cares about too much, let's just be honest. Most people I know of anyway are probably just going to want to plonk down their cash for the 8700K, but I will say if the 8600K overclocks pretty well, six cores could be pretty pretty dip good. If it's if it was around the 200, you know, 250 US dollar mark, I can understand a compelling set of scenarios to go for that. But we'll have to just wait and see how it compares, of course, to Ryzen. Obviously, Intel have said that we're going to see about a 15% jump um, performance-wise. Some have said 30%, but apparently that's only for low-power devices. So let's say 15% uh, and maybe take 10% off, uh, sorry, 5% off of that for PR numbers. So let's say 10% over Cable Lake per clock. Then equivalently, you can you can make a pretty good argument, especially if you can flash the current motherboard. So let's say you own a Skylake motherboard, like a Z170 base board, or perhaps even a Z270, because Coffee Lake isn't coming out, you know, too long in the in the distant future. It's only a couple of months, really. If you're saving your pennies and you've already got a pretty decent board, pretty decent setup, you could make an argument anyway to go with like 8700K. But obviously, you're going to miss out on some of the shinies that Coffee Lake brings. So that really is dependent upon you and if you really give a toss about those. With all of that said, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.